ADHD Rewired, episode 444. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDRewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Back on the podcast today from Renify is Rick Webster. Rick has expertise in real estate and entrepreneurship and ADHD. He has managed all kinds of things in the sort of financial and real estate world. And over the last uh, couple of years, he's put his focus in uh, helping people with ADHD make better peace and better sense of their finances. See what I did there? Better sense with... I thought it was clever. Okay. Um, yeah. As CEO of Renify, which is R-E-N-A-F-I, Rick brings perspective, vision, and passion to an area of life he considers foundational, personal money management. His motto has always been, it's not just business, it's personal. Rick, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's an honor to be here, and I'd love to talk about these kind of things. They impact so many people, right? And, and a lot of the solutions are very difficult, but some of them are incredibly easy to implement if we just become aware. So be before we officially kind of dive into this conversation, because we're going to be talking today about the ADHD tax, you, you shared with me that you are at your sister's place and uh, she she raises dog-sized roosters. Is that That's right. My niece does. <laughs> and she keeps them here because they're out in the country. Yeah. So there is a possibility that we may hear some uh, some roosters. So if the um, if uh, if the audio is foul, I apologize. I <laughs> yeah, good on those. those okay, I, I'm on a, I'm on a roll here today with my really bad dad jokes. All right, so let's talk about the ADHD tax. Why do you, why is this a topic that you think is is so important? I think it's absolutely crucial. If I was to skip to the very end of it, I would say there's a 12-year reduction in life expectancy for people with persistent long-term chronic stress. And people with ADHD, according to Russell Barkley, that's 61% of us. So it, it, it's absolutely huge. And if we move farther back up the timeline, it's hard to live your life. It's hard to be emotionally available to your kids when you're worried about getting an eviction notice from the door. It's hard to plan for the future and, and budget for the future when you're paying late fees and, and penalties to the IRS and, and all these other things that we end up doing. When we have an uninsured car accident, right, it, we end up having to pay for it. And frequently, as the ADHD person, we're, we're more, more often than not, we're the ones at fault for that. So, you know, it's, it's really challenging. And it's something we kind of get used to, but when we realize how much better our financial life could be and therefore, you know, our overall emotional life, it's a problem worth tackling. Yeah, I'm sure with, with your community and as well with mine, I, I've heard so many stories of people paying the ADHD tax and I have, and I have a fair number of my own stories of paying the ADHD tax. But let's first define, what, what do you mean by the ADHD tax? The ADHD tax is really the, the price we pay for unremediated ADHD and the ADHD symptoms. And that might be procrastination. It might be perfectionism. It might be impulsiveness, which by the way, impulsiveness is not impulsivity in, in a way. I, I'd love to talk about that a little bit, but there are precursors to that. It didn't just happen in a vacuum. And if we can go upstream and interrupt those precursors, then we can change that behavior. But it's all the things that end up costing us a lot of money. And I would say the first thing out the gate is People with ADHD uh, earn roughly 75% of what their similarly talented counterparts earn. So you start off with 75 cents on the dollar based on your training and your capabilities. 
And then that 75 cents gets further whittled away in, in late fees and in a variety of different things. Late, late fees are the thing I point to, but there's much bigger issues than late fees. That's just the thing we get mad at ourselves about. And that's part of the ADHD tax too, this guilt and shame and self-castigation, you know, oh, I did it again. What's wrong with me? So you're right? kind of, you're kind of creating a larger umbrella when you talk about ADHD tax, but you know, I think when, for a lot of us, we really think about the financial piece and then, you know, when we end up having to pay more, whether it's in late fees or rush shipping, or you misread the the details on the uh, the itinerary. And so there, that a non-refundable deposit you made and showed up what you thought was on time, but was the wrong day. All of these kinds of things cost money. Absolutely. They all do. It's funny you say that for 50 years ago, whatever it was, I showed up on the wrong day for one of my really important finals in, in, in college. And I just, <laughs> wrong day. I mean, who does that on finals? Pretty important we do. Day. We do. <laughs> but, but yeah, <laughs> it, is, does that. it is typically thought of in the money area. It's just that money impacts everything else, which is why I kind of go to that. You know, at Renify, we talk about behavioral finance, the reasons behind the behaviors that we have. We need to address those issues. We can't just rigidly say, I'm not going to buy anything anymore. It just doesn't work, right? We have to address the emotional issues. And you're right. We all have our horror stories. I'd be happy to tell you one of mine if you want. But it's, it's some of these things, they really add up to draconian kind of impacts. They really do. You know, I asked my, uh, in, in my coaching community, um, how have you paid the ADSG tax? And I got, I've gotten a, a couple of uh, really nice sharing responses. We have, uh, Laura says, uh, OMG, I have paid that ADSG tax so, so often. I'd love some recommendations on extremely simple slash easy budgeting tools. A lot of budgeting books have too many steps. So I get started, then poop out before I've finished. I have Quicken on my computer, but I never use it. It's confusing. And the balance is always incorrect because it doesn't sync with the bank automatically. And that's so, actually a really good segue in, in a way. Um, I, I think budgeting is really important. There's no doubt about that, but it is not the primary problem. Anybody can do that relatively low level math to add up what they're earning and add up what they're spending and do the adding and subtracting and say, yo, I'm upside down by $400. Let's do something about it. Anybody could do that. But unfortunately, we don't. So the problem isn't getting a better budget. The problem is figuring out why we're not doing those things that are in our budget in the first place. If we figure that out and if the budget's not working, we can easily just rework it. We said, okay, you know, I, I left out a few things. I need to print out more bank statements. Maybe I only printed out three months, which is a recommendation, but then I missed my property taxes, which come around twice a year and they weren't in those three months. So, you know, we make those kind of mistakes and we fixed them, but the chronic issues have more to do with our identity and who we are as a person and that is going to inform everything else. And if you try to do things that are in conflict with your identity, you can do it with self-discipline for a little while, but you will eventually come back to that point of equilibrium you out in the first place. We, we need to change our identity. You know, a very simple way to look at this is if I have a to-do list and I only do seven things on it out of 10, I can't honestly say to myself, I'm a person who gets things done because there's three important things that I didn't get done, right? But if I can put a to-do list of five things and do all five plus another two, I've done the same thing. I've still done seven. But now I can honestly say I'm a person who gets things done. If I can't say to myself, I'm a person who gets things done, I'm not likely to get things done tomorrow. I'll get some things done because mm -hmm. I'm that person. I get some things done. But if I can say to myself, everything I put on my, my agenda for tomorrow, I'm going to get done. You will get it done because it's your identity. So we need to shift the identity and then the rest of it starts to smooth out because the rest of it is symptoms. You know, it's when uh, with this uh, memory that was sharing, one of the things she identified in the in her challenge, I think, is also the solution. She says that it doesn't sync with the bank automatically. I think that's a fixable problem, right? Like if you have software that needs to talk to the bank for it to work, like spend the time to fix the software because it's going to save so much time going forward in the future. I wanted to share another uh, uh, comment from Amy. I almost, and of course, almost is in all, in all uh, caps, I almost paid the ADHD tax with an escrow check to my mortgage company that was in my mess of papers. My stomach sunk when I saw it because it was over $1,000. I wouldn't have found it in time if I didn't choose to work on that task during my ARC ASH session. So it's in our coaching groups, we do a, uh, a study hall session. And then uh, she says, I definitely not submitted for reimbursement at my old job. Also, I always do my taxes at the last possible second and don't know if I do them right. And I always owe a lot. So if I plan ahead and delegate it, I might be able to save some money there. 
Yeah, no, that's all ADHD tax. You, you kind of reminded me of one that I, and it's something we, we forget so much, right? We forget, but I, you know, I'm the regional chapter coordinator for Chad in Northern California. And as such, I kind of need to go to the conference every year, which is coming up in November. And I recommend to anybody, that's a great conference. If you I'll be get. there. I'll speak in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll see you there then. That's great. The, what you triggered in my memory was, it was probably three years ago now, I went, like I, like I always do. And being the regional chapter coordinator, uh, my chapter reimburses it. All I have to do is turn in the receipts. That's all and, you, know, you have to do, Rick. <laughs> so, no, I think it was like 1300 bucks. I never did it. I still oh, have my. the stuff, you know, but I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to send it to them yeah. now, you know, I'm just. <laughs> well, now that you've audited yourself about that, do you think it would be easier to actually move forward and submit that reimbursement? It's almost the opposite. Well, no, I, I actually don't think I will. I mean, it's a nonprofit. They're fine, you know, but the. The fact that I did not submit on time makes it actually more likely that I won't submit the next thing on time, right? We mm. develop habits and routines, and that's a big part of why budgeting isn't going to work unless we change our identity. Because if your identity is, I don't do those things, you know, I can write it out, but by tomorrow I'll be doing something else. If that's my identity, you don't need to bother writing it out because it's it's doomed, right? So the fact that I didn't submit for reimbursement made it more likely that I would make that same mistake somewhere else. You know, one of the, you mentioned habits and routines, when I was at the very beginning phases, about a year, two or so ago, of going through my divorce and my, my ex was the one who managed like basically all, all the financial management, she managed all of it. And so I knew that I had a, it was going to be a pretty steep learning curve for me because now I had to start uh, doing this on my own. And my therapist, you know, one of the things that she was really pushing me on doing is developing a habit of just checking my bank accounts each day. And like at first I was like, that just sounds awful. It actually now has become a habit. But one of the things that I often hear people say is that they want to do their financial stuff every either once a week or once a month. And I think the, the challenge with that is if that day that you're planning on doing it, the ADHD is winning, then you might go two months until the next time you do it. So I think that stuff like finance, because it's so easy to get behind so quickly, Having like short increments of frequent check-ins on your finances, I have found to be a lot more successful. What have you seen? Absolutely. And, and you remind me of when I was recently diagnosed about 26 years ago, I, my entire life. Had Wait, did you just say you were recently diagnosed 26 years ago? No, when I was, when, when oh, okay. I was diagnosed at okay. that moment. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> moment, I was not actually in recovery yet, but I was, I, my entire financial life had, had fallen apart. I mean, mm. I'm not going to go into it, but super, I was living out of the country with my empty nester, you know, in-laws, right. And with money that I'd borrowed to get there, you know, <laughs> with my whole family and stuff. So it was a mess, you know, it's another thing, but when I had been recently diagnosed, I recognize that I need to become really almost hyper aware of this stuff. I might not have to be do that forever when I develop better habits or whatever. But in the beginning, yeah, when I start opening up new accounts, I would say, you know, I'm going to check that account every freaking day. Right. And, and I did that with my credit card things and I got really obsessive about it. I would charge like $60 on my credit card, maybe for a tank of gas. Two days later, when it posted, I'd go in there and pay it off. Right. I was just... I am not going to allow that balance, which is that's one thing we teach at Renify. That credit line is not your money, right? That's the only problem with a credit card. Credit cards are wonderful as long as you know and you realize and you respect that it's not your money. It's a convenience. You buy a tank of gas with it, sure, but then you pay it off. And I'm certainly not suggesting someone has to go in there every day like I was doing at first. But that was really important for me to be really have a top of mind and make sure nothing was getting out of control because my life had gotten out of control. and I didn't want to go back that way. So now I don't check nearly as often, but I'm absolutely diligent about paying attention to those things. You know, it's interesting because the way the what you just describes kind of reminds me of me when it came to planning 20 some years ago. It was my, my sort of time management and uh, just sort of kind of the general productivity type skills were so poor. And so I kind of had that determination where I was like, if I'm going to do something with my life, I have to figure this out because I knew that this was going to be the thing that is going to either help me have the life that I want to or prevent me from having the life that I want to. And so I dug in so deep and, and even far outside of the ADHD sort of world in, in time management. And I found a lot of stuff that I was able to then break down and make it more uh, in alignment with more ADHD friendly approaches. And so I kind of became this, like a, a master student of time management stuff. 
And now it, it's not that I always do the stuff 100% of the time, because I don't think any of us do any of the stuff that we are, we're even good at 100% of the time. But sometimes I even don't do it as much as I encourage other people to do it because it is more automatic and it's easier for me to come back to it. And so that habit and that routine of any of these good habits, that it's, it's important to focus on a particular domain until you feel like at least you have some semblance of what the hell you're doing. Totally agree with that. And I think we talk about hitting rock bottom and I, my personal belief is there's no rock bottom until you're, you're dead. Right. So whatever ledge you have landed on, that feels like rock bottom might not be rock bottom. And it's time to kind of wake up and do something about it. And for me, the, the, the finance part of it is I woke up, I said, this is not my life. My life is over there somewhere. And if I'm never going to get there, I'm the common denominator of my life. I have to do it. Right. I can find people to help me, but I have to do it. And so this idea that this was a huge pain point for me, caused me to put a lot of energy into that to solve that problem. And I think for a lot of us, that's what happens. Sometimes we have to hit a pain point that's bad enough to where you say, you know, okay, I really don't want to address this stuff and it's really hard, but my life's over there and it's worth it. I want to get there somehow. We, we could have a whole talk on time management because I actually, I I've realized that time management is like budgeting, right? Absolutely. They'll make a great plan, a great time management plan, and then they don't do it and they say, and then beat themselves up because they didn't do it. And then they go back to the daytimer and try to do it better next time. Better wasn't the problem. The problem was underlying identity issues. Were they a person who got things done, for example, in, in that area? So I believe, um, and I, I think he's a, a partner of yours, Will Curb. He talks about energy management and yeah. I totally buy into that. Yeah. You know, it's actually kind of funny that we're talking about the ADSG text today because I'm sitting here with, yeah. on my desk, I have a clipboard. I have a bunch of just disgusting looking tax document forms. Um, they all look gross to me because this is a, a um, amendment to my 2020 taxes because I my accountant discovered that I didn't actually make my uh, contributions to my retirement account as I thought I did. Because he asked if I was making, I said, yeah. And then I didn't realize, oh, I actually have to make the contribution for it to count. So it's like, now I have to write a check for, you know, a, you know, so it's this kind of stuff happens. It, it absolutely does. And I think we should forgive ourselves to an extent because if we get too perfectionistic, that is a problem in the other direction. Like if I was still checking about checking my bank account every day, that would be a problem because I have better things to do with my life than that. And actually, when we get into some of the remediations for the ADHD tax, one of them is to automate everything. Just automate, automate, automate. Anything that can be automated, do it. And, and if, if something's not syncing up with your bank account, as I think one of your people suggested, mm -hmm. call them up, send them an email, you know, get on the, the portal and do that chat thing on the side of the screen, but find out why it's not happening because it's all mechanical. It's all computer driven. If there's a mistake in there somewhere, it's probably us, right? The, the machine's getting it right. So we need to redo that. And there may be just some really easy minor fix, but we want to automate everything. You should not be putting a stamp on a check and mailing it out anymore. That, that's just it's a waste of your life. So if you put all your bills to be pulled off of a credit card or a debit card, if you prefer, credit card's a little better, I can explain that. If you put them all on that and you keep that credit card balance down to zero, you will never pay another late fee on any of those items yeah. again. You'll never forget. And you won't have to stay up at night wondering, do I have enough money to cover it or any of those kind of things. You, this, this ADHD tax is not just the money you don't get or that you lose. It's also the stress and the, the reduction in your quality of life. So I would make I would make living a zero balance living kind of almost a religion. You know, I'm not talking about home loans. That's different. Student loans. That's different. But as far as credit cards and, and all those things, make sure that you're keeping a zero balance on all those things. All right. We will. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll have uh, some more stories of paying the ADHD tax as well as strategies to help with that. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's award-winning coaching and accountability groups at coachingrewired.com. How would it feel to work beside other people with ADHD? What would be the impact on your life to be part of a community of people who just get it? What would it be worth if you could gain more clarity on your priorities to better understand the ways your ADHD shows up and finally take action on the things that matter most to you? Early bird registration is over, but don't miss your chance to join us for this fall's season starting September 29th and 30th through December 8th and 9th. Take the first step by getting on our interest list at coachingrewired.com. 
This group is like a scaffolding for us to move from intention to action. And the scaffolding's above the, the muck and the stories and everything else. If you have a scaffolding in a building, you're renovating it. You could be renovating or renewing it. And that building is us. For me, the building project is trying to open the windows, increase the size of the windows. And when the size of the windows increase, more light gets in. And just as importantly, more of our light gets out. This is what it feels like to join this group. In a world of many kinds of boats, I have tried to be on a crew with specific skills that were never useful. I would try to help, but either slow down the boat, add loads of work for myself or someone else. And then I joined this group and finally on a boat like I was meant to be. We are in sync. We understand so much of the mechanics of this ADHD boat. This group of strangers, we got together and came into this thing thinking we were our own special kind of broken. But we grew together, uplifted each other, and saw how we're not broken and we're not alone. And we built this beautiful community of support. I saw this group and I knew this was my place. I think that group is not about finding the support or the techniques to grind through the tasks and the difficulties that you've had in life, but it's giving you the push to relax into it, to be gentle with yourself, experiment, tweak, laugh, cry, and just like accept and be more open. If you're thinking about joining this group, I've never liked the idea for myself of any kind of group coaching or therapy or support group. I've always figured my difficulties were so severe that I needed the full attention of an individual coach or therapist, which I've done, and that I would not be able to get enough out of a group. However, group coaching through ARC has been more beneficial than I possibly could have imagined. It's been amazing being surrounded by people, including the coach, who all have ADHD. If you're wondering if you can live intentionally and work smarter instead of just working harder, your support can start with a community where you will be seen, understood, and accepted. Take that first step to join us this fall by going to coachingrewired.com and click on the yellow button at the top of the page to start your pre-registration process. Our next fall registration event is this Thursday, September 1st. We are doing one in the evening. It's at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. If you can't make it, go to coachingrewired.com anyways to get your name on our interest list to stay informed of our upcoming registration events. Deadlines to submit for all pre-registration submissions is 11.59 p.m. Central Time, the day before our registration events. So go to coachingrewired.com to get started with your pre-registration process. You know, if there is one thing I can absolutely promise is that if you come into this group with ADHD, you're still gonna have ADHD at the end of the 10 weeks. But support doesn't stop there because we know maintenance is hard and we don't need to face our challenges alone. Join the coaching group for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD where growth happens through community and growth continues in our alumni membership community. And if you are listening to this weeks, months, or years after this came out, head on over to coachingrewired.com for the most up-to-date information to learn how you can come grow with us. That's coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list or if you're listening to this way in the future, whatever season is coming up next. That's coachingrewired.com. We can't wait to meet you. All right, we are back. So Rick, I wanted to share with uh, one of uh, another one of my community members. Didn't pay a speeding ticket. License was suspended. Pull over again. Arrested for driving with a suspended license. Paid much more than the original speeding ticket for a lawyer. The speeding tickets and additional charges for reinstating my license. Yes, you know, and I, <laughs> it's almost like my life. I didn't get arrested. I didn't get arrested. I, I dodged that. But, you know, I've told this story a few times before. Maybe people have heard it. But I once had three speeding tickets that added up to $800 and I didn't pay them and I didn't pay them. And a couple of different times I had my license suspended. And, you know, I said, oh, that's okay. I can drive carefully. I won't get caught. Right. And which I did. I didn't get caught. And of course, I didn't have a license. So I didn't have insurance. It was really a nightmare in a way. I mean, looking, anybody else would have said that's a nightmare. I was just saying, oh, okay, I can manage this. But that $800 over a course of, I don't know, five to seven years, it turned into $11,000. Oh, my over, God. Over $11,000. And they finally were sending me this mail that said, you know, if you don't come in, we're coming to get you. We're going to arrest you. Right. If you don't come deal with this. 
Well, that was finally, it got loud enough for me to hear. I went into the court and waited my time. And I was literally in front of the judge three or four minutes. That was it, right? He just said, is this who you are? Is this what you owe? Do you agree with all this stuff? And I just said, yes, yes, yes. And he says, okay, can you pay that today? And I said, no, I can't pay that today. I would have paid it if I could have paid it today. Then he said, well, can you pay a hundred bucks a month? And I said, of course I can pay a hundred bucks a month, right? And so he stamps his papers, sends me to the clerk, and I'm done, right? That's all it took. I could have done that at $800. I didn't have to wait for 11,000, right? But that's uh, all it took. I feel that. So yeah, I, I feel that. There are just so many common threads because as you said, I'm, I'm almost laughing, right? And that's what happens. They, they, they go out of our mind. We're not paying attention to them. We haven't really forgotten, but we're ignoring it because you know, we got louder noises in our head. Mm -hmm. And then eventually something happens that triggers it. And it's, oh my gosh, okay, I guess I have to deal with that now. You know what? I feel a lot of those things that we're like, we're aware of and we're thinking about, but not like thinking about it enough to do something about it. Right. Like once we do something about it, I feel like all of these unfinished tasks and, and a lot of these are, you know, five minute, 10 minute tasks to, the, just to, to hammer out. It's sort of like this like low level rumble in the background of our mind. It's if, you know, most people have been at home and the power goes out, Right. And you don't realize how much noise is generated in your home just by all like the buzzing and humming of all of our appliances until the power goes out. And you realize how quiet it can really be when your house has no power, right? And I kind of feel like a lot of these tasks are kind of like that in our minds. There's this low level kind of just hum, but it's it's a disturbance because it's it's not allowing us to have more peace of mind and focus in the areas that actually matter most. There's no doubt. Yeah. And, and that's what that's what my company Renify is all about. It's behavioral finance. It, it's psychology based. And, and, you know, I have a psychology background, but we bring in other people too. Um, I, I think part of it is a lot of people get a diagnosis of ADHD, but they don't really believe it. I just have to work a little harder. The fact is that there's a very real difference, structural, chemical difference in our brain. This is a physical thing. It's not, not psychiatric. It yields psychiatric things like depression and all that, but it, it itself is not a psychiatric issue. And it's for the life of me. And, and you know, I, I understand that it, that it's physical, but I do these things like you're talking about that, you know, I put it off, put it off. And finally I did it. And it only took five minutes. And I say, you know, Rick, just live with that for a minute. Just realize all the stress that you got rid of in five minutes. Just remember that. So the next time you don't do that again, but the next time I do it again, right. I mean, it's, it's, there is a physical difference. We got to get away from this idea that it's willpower. There are definitely yeah. structures and things like that that we can put in place. And, and I'm a, a true believer in medication, which I didn't used to be. But now that I understand a little bit more, medication makes a huge difference because it, it helps balance out that part of the brain. Mm -hmm. Let's, I want to, uh, I want to share with you what uh, Phoebe from our community uh, said. Um, Ugh, I pay the ADHD tax every day, paying late fees, rebuying things I can't find, spending impulsively, paying for things I'm not using because I didn't cancel them or forgot to return them in time, expedited shipping because I didn't order something in time, buying takeout because I wasn't organized enough to have dinner ready, etc., cetera, et cetera. It's constant. One of the main reasons I decided to join the coaching groups is because I think it will pay for itself if I can get my act together uh, enough to avoid some of this constant ADHD tax. My mantra for 2022 is think things through, then follow through. But it's not working that well because I don't think things through early enough to avoid ADHD tax consequences. So our question is, how can I be triggered to think things through at an early enough time that I can follow through in a way that lets me avoid the tax. You know, I, I, I love that. And, and first of all, let me say, I think, I think it's excellent that this person is taking advantage of, of your system because we are social creatures. And if we try to do this in a vacuum all by ourselves, it's like a, an astronaut spacewalker in space. If they don't have anything to push off against, if there's no friction, they can't get anywhere, right? Yeah. So we work well with other people and we need to, obviously we need to pick the right people so we don't feel ashamed and, you know, and all that. So it's absolutely crucial. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was that? What? <laughs> oh, oh, I know. It was the 100% on board with this idea that you look upstream for the precursors, right? You figure out where you were led down this path that ended up with the impulsive shopping. If you just try to attack the impulsive shopping, say, you know, hey, I'm not going to get on Amazon. It isn't going to work, right? It's just not going to work. You'll find it. It's like whack-a-mole. You'll find another place to do it. You'll find another way. There's something else that you need. My metaphor that I have that I think really makes this clear to people 
if you were the pilot, if you were flying from San Francisco to Hawaii, you're autopilot and you would make minor changes all the way along and you would end up spot on right where you're supposed to be. If you didn't pay attention to those precursors of getting off course, you could be 500 miles north of the islands. You might not even have enough fuel to get there, right? You might not have enough money in the bank when you go to retire to pay your bills and you no longer can trade your time for money. So it's really important to look upstream. It takes less of a severe change. When you change something little upstream, it makes big differences down the road. You know, when uh, uh, Russell Barkley talks about um, creating reminders and cues at the point of performance, right? And so often when we're setting up reminders at the point of performance, this has to do with a particular action. When we have something that we want to keep in mind that's more of like a mindset, that's a little bit different because we still need to be reminded, but it's kind of hard to, how do we strategically remind ourselves of this mindset piece when it's something we're, we're wanting to sort of encompass everything? And, you know, one of the things that I really recommend is taking a word or a phrase and putting it somewhere prominent in your environment. You're, if you know how to use like Canva, you know, create a cool like design using that word or question or, or phrase that you want to keep in mind, print it out or even frame it, get it professionally uh, printed so you can have almost a piece of artwork that's going to cue you on a regular basis, right? Until you no longer see it because it's part of the background because it's been on your wall all year. <laughs> I love that. And, and I think my version of that is I have various kind of mantras. You might call them affirmations. I don't know, but things that I tell myself. The thing about an affirmation, it can't just be total fantasy, right? It won't, that won't work. But you can tell your things, tell things that are maybe a slight stretch, but they need to be pretty much true. And then when you say them over and over again, they become cemented in. One of the ones I was just thinking of is I've cut back on the things that I do to the point where I, I always plan tomorrow tonight. So whatever I, is on my plan I'm going to do it because during the day, I'm the, I'm the worker bee. I'm not the CEO of my life. I'm the one that that plan is directing the traffic. So what I have done is I make very careful, sure that I don't put too much on that plate. And then I even have to stay up till midnight. I'm going to get it done. And if you do that enough times, you can look in the mirror and honestly say to yourself, I'm a person who gets things done. And that's a much more powerful position than to be the person who says, yeah, I get seven out of 10 things done every day. Right. That's a different, different thing altogether. Another mantra that I that I planted in my head is do fewer things and do them better. Right. I yes. was trying to do too many things. It was all yep. mediocre. Now, there's people that are perfectionistic. I'm not saying we, we want to get too far down that path, but I was just today's an example. I, I had so many things going on and the phone kept ringing and emails came in and things kept adding in faster than I could knock them down. But by putting fewer things on my plate, I actually had room to handle those things and they did get done. And so I think it's a good thing for ADHD people too, who we have a tendency to anytime something happens, we say, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do, we volunteer for everything. And then we, we fail on a lot of that stuff. And then we end up looking like a flake and then we feel badly about it. And so then we volunteer for something else so we can feel good about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Saying, saying no is so important or at the very yeah. least, don't let yes be your default. Let it be. Um, I don't think so. Let me check my calendar and I'll get back to you if I can. This has worked incredibly well for me. And some people, you know, their, their jaw drops when I say it. But the fact is, instead of letting yes be my default, no is my default now. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it. It simply says, not right now. Let me think about it. I'll get right back to you. Maybe I only need to think about it for five minutes. Maybe I need to think about it for a day or two, depending on the gravity of it. But I'm not just going to say yes because it's exciting. I'm going to say, let me think about it. It's amazing how often I come back to somebody who wanted me to help them with something and I come back and say, yeah, I've thought about it a little bit. I can really help you with this 10% of it. And then you're good to go on the rest. You know how to do this stuff. I don't need to sit with you the entire time, right? And that happens with people at Renify and such. So the idea, not in a rude, obnoxious way, but when people ask me for stuff, generally speaking, almost always, it's, you know, let me think about it. Right, because when you say yes, what are you going to say no to? Well, and also when you say, here's another thing. It's really insidious to say yes, because when you say yes, people love it right? And you get a certain amount of validation for that. There's only a little bit of validation left for completing the project, right? You've already got some of it and there's yeah. a little bit left. So rather than completing the project, why not go volunteer for something else and get somebody else to be really happy about you and then volunteer for something else? And mathematically, 
It's exactly what happens. And, and in our minds, that's what happens. We all know people who say yes, 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 and they have a really low completion rate. It's because they're getting all the validation from saying yes, and they become addicted to that. It's actually the remediation for that is when you're going to do something like I'm going to quit smoking, don't tell anybody. Don't tell them you're going to because you tell them you quit smoking, that you're going to. They, they say, oh, that's really great. They pat you on the back. You've already gotten some of your validation. If you don't tell them until you've actually quit, I mean, really quit, then you get all the validation for actually performing the task. And then you begin to train your mind for completion rather than for instant validation. You know, I've seen, I've seen some of their research about that discourages the public sharing of goals. I have, I'm not sure I agree with it. And I think it has to do with, part of it has to do with, with temperament, but it also I think has to do with how, like what you're actually wanting that accountability on. Cause I, you know, myself included, like I know lots and lots of people who are actually highly motivated mm -hmm. and it helps them to stay accountable when they've shared that goal with others. So um, before we, before we keep going, we're going to take one more quick break. And when we come back, we got some more stories and more strategies for you to uh, really cut down that ADHD tax. And I want so to go back to that idea you just had because it, it, that's cut across a certain line. All right, write it down so we don't forget. I got it. We will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall at adultstudyhall.com, the virtual co-working community built for adults with ADHD who just get it. From our weekly guided sessions, also known as Ash Plus, to our 24-7 drop-in room, this just might be the virtual co-working community you didn't even know you needed. It's only $19.99 a month, and it's free to try for the first week. This is the virtual co-working and body doubling community where people with ADHD are getting things done while also having some fun because we don't have to tackle any of our to-dos alone. Come join us. Try it risk-free for the first week and it's only $19.99 a month after that. Go to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Perks like ad-free episodes start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. Are you looking for a little taste of coaching? For only $25 a month, you can join me for our monthly Patreon coaching call. This is for patrons only. We do it every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. You get that plus our ad-free episodes. And at $10 a month, you can also get a recording, audio recording of our monthly coaching calls. So at $25 a month, you get the monthly coaching calls, the audio recording of our monthly coaching calls, and our ad-free episodes in our private RSS feed that connects to almost every podcast app out there. We appreciate all of your support on Patreon, no matter the amount. If it is in your budget right now and you find value in this show, consider becoming a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Perks start at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. Your support helps make possible the things that we do here at ADHD Rewired. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks again for your support. All right, we are back with Rick Webster with Renify. And uh, what did you write down before we went to break? Because uh, we didn't want you to forget. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I have a memory, short-term memory of a goldfish. And, and that actually is probably overly complimentary to myself. <laughs> um, yeah, this idea of sometimes sharing what we're going to do makes it less likely that it will happen. And that's pretty well documented, but not always. In some cases, it makes it, it works the other way around. The place where that parses out, generally speaking, and there's exceptions to this too, but if it's a team effort and you want accountability, then you want to share it with someone, right? If it's a team effort, if you're putting something together like a, a business project or something, then you share it with them and say, you know, I'm really having a hard time getting this blog written and all these different things, but I'm on a team. And if I don't get it done, I'm letting you down. And I'm just telling you right now, I intend to do this today. That'll make it more likely you do it. Yeah. They're going to be looking for you tomorrow morning. So where is that? Now, you know that, right? On the other hand, if it's an individual item personal to you, like quitting smoking, it actually makes it less likely because now I've got the validation 
It's all inside of me. There's no accountability to anybody. You know, I, maybe I have to look sideways at that person next time I pass them on the street, but you know, it's not, I, I've learned to numb myself out to that. That's what happens. I, I, so, I do wonder like, uh, if there is, you know, the similar to the, the uh, sort of that pop psychology myth that's been debunked that it takes 30 days to form a habit. Nonsense. Like, you know, it takes as long as it takes. Right. And I think like all things when we're dealing with personal growth and self-improvement, especially with ADHD, but this is, you know, even outside of ADHD, you have to experiment and figure out what works for you. There's not a single thing that's going to work for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the 30, 30 days to seven days to form a habit, it's, it's total nonsense. If you want to form a habit, you can do it in 30 seconds. If you tie it to something that you've been doing for a long time and you tie it, uh, the, the example I heard like, 30 years ago, a woman was going to work every day on the New York subway and she always had a Diet Coke on the way. She couldn't remember to take her medication to save her life. But the day she said, I'll take my medication with that Diet Coke, she never forgot it again, right? So the 30 days, I mean, we've all had experiences. I've gone to the gym for like three or four months in a row. And then one day it's just over, just over. It's not tied to anything. If it was tied <laughs> oh, to something, man. it would be more likely to happen and stay keep happening. Um, I'm laughing because I've been kind of slipping a bit on my uh, workout routine. And uh, it's it's real. You know, the struggle is real. All right, I want to share another uh, another story here. This is from, uh, from Britta from our community. I've paid it on rush order charges for custom sized bridesmaid dresses that still don't fit quite right and don't have time for alterations before the event. So I don't look and feel as good as I do uh, in what is tailored exactly to me. I've paid it more on expensive repairs to my vehicle slash yard equipment slash house appliances instead of the regular preventative maintenance that would have prevented the damage in the first place. I have paid out-of-pocket costs for my meds because my insurance lapsed, or I never sent the reimbursement forms for what would be covered if I do the extra steps. How do I know what the preventative maintenance tasks are on my big or expensive things, often appliances? I feel like I, quote, should be able to do many of uh, them myself. Furnace filters, for example. Would I be paying an ADHD tax by paying people to come to do some of the easier tasks for my appliances because they at least know and will call me to schedule these things when they're due? How can I do a cost comparison on that without analysis paralysis? Ooh, I like this question. Yeah, I'm a total believer in paying someone to do stuff that, that knows how to do it better. I mean, in my dad's generation, it was if you want it done right, do it yourself. Not anymore. Now, if you want to get yeah. right, you hire someone who actually knows how to do it. And the fact is, okay, here's, here's something from my very early real estate career, practically the first day that the guy was up on stage telling us how to do stuff and all that. And one of the first things he said was, if you're mowing your own lawn, you're losing money. And most people, they say, well, no, I'm, I'm mowing my own lawn, so I don't have to pay the landscaper, right? So I don't have to pay the gardener. Well, if you're trained to do something for hundred bucks an hour and you can hire it done, the, that other, the lawn for $25 an hour, you're actually losing money. That's part of the ADHD tax as well. If you can't let go and hire someone and myself in, in terms of appliances and all that, I would absolutely put it on some kind of regular maintenance schedule, but say, you know what, once every three years, I'm going to have this particular company that I like and they're loyal to them because they're really good to me come in for some fairly, you know, low expense fee to come in and take care of it. And I feel like I, except for the bridesmaid dress part of that post, I feel like I could have written that post myself because it's especially the house stuff. It is. Yeah. I, um, I, I sometimes question the, the wisdom of me being a homeowner because I'm not great at the maintenance stuff uh, of my home. Homeownership is absolutely huge. You don't have a landlord that comes and fixes your sink, right? You need to maintain it. And if you don't fix the drippy drain under the sink for for hundred bucks, you're going to spend three thousand dollars getting rid of the dry rod a few years later. So we do need to maintain. But there are companies out there if you don't want to do it yourself that will come out and do it, and that's that's how they make their living. Hey, Rick, so are you saying that uh, when I um, was thinking that there might have been a leak in the shower. And then when we investigated it to find that there was actually soft drywall behind the shower. And now the shower has been inoperable in my master bedroom for over a year now. Um, Cause I just haven't gotten around to getting somebody else in there to, to actually get the, yeah. the bathroom. And it's just like, and part of me is wondering by not doing anything about this, even though we, we have another shower in the, uh, our upstairs, like by not having someone come look at this, am I going to be paying an even bigger ADHD tax because it's something that I didn't even know about that's, that's potentially going to be affected? Every day you wait. Yeah, <laughs> it, because what's happened, and, and this is my background, I mean, real estate, real estate development, oh, yeah. renovation and lending and portfolio and all that, all that stuff. 
So what's happened is you had a little leak and it did some damage and it could have been fixed for whatever, you know, 500 bucks. But by letting that moisture sit in there, now you've got dry rot and all that sort of stuff. And that's getting worse because dry rot's a fungus and it, it grows, right? It goes through your wood. And then even worse than that is you end up getting some mold in there and that can be a huge problem to remediate. So yeah, it, these things don't get better with time. I'm not saying you have to panic and fix it today, but it should definitely be on your agenda for the next, you know, three or four or five, six months or something. It should not be. It, oh, it, it has continued to be on my agenda for like every month for the last like 12 months. Well, then you need, you need to have a kind of a, a, a deadline. I need, a, and, I need an intervention, Rick. That's what I need. So one of the ways that, you know, I, I established deadlines for myself, I not really thought about it this way, but in that particular case, I'd probably call up the termite company, whoever it is that's going to remediate the bathroom there and say, you know, I, I don't want it done now, but can we schedule an appointment for, for October? Once you put it on your calendar, it's much more it's like- It's so true. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. When I, uh, I mean, even like last, um, I played piano and I had my piano tuned like about six months ago. And my, my plan was to schedule my next one before the guy left. I don't remember what happened, but that didn't happen. Cause, but I was remember thinking if I, all right, if I schedule this before he leaves, cause that's how I deal with my doctors, right? Like I never leave a doctor's appointment, like a dentist or a, a you know, primary care without scheduling the next one. I don't take appointment cards because if I do, that's, that's an intention to put it in my calendar and it won't happen. And then I'll get charged a late fee because I didn't put it in my calendar. Then I'll forget about it. Right. There's, we mentioned uh, some automation, but there's also the systemization that I think is really important with, with a lot of these things and creating that, those sort of like rules for living. Cause once we, once we can take decision making of, oh, should I do this now? Or should I just like, like, don't tax your executive functions that way. Like do the thing, have the rule. It's all about systems. I mean, that's a lot of what we teach at Renify. Goals are nice, but goals, you know, you think about the secret. If I just dream, think about it, dream about it enough, it'll manifest it. Everything will happen. It yeah. doesn't happen that way. <laughs> Right. You have a goal, which you, you do need to know where you're trying to get to, but then it's the systems that you put in place to get you there. And if you're not getting there, you need to alter those systems a little bit. You know, like I told someone just in my work today, we had some worksheets we have to get done before we do something with Attitude Magazine and, and they wanted it right away. And I finally just said, you know, I'm not getting this done. If you're not getting it done, you need to find another way to get it done, right? And, you know, the person I was talking to wasn't exactly happy about it because she's got a lot of stuff to do, but she said, oh, okay, I'll do it. And I know she will, and I try not to impose too often, but we have to find a way to get these important things done. Mm -hmm. And we, at Renify, we do, we definitely talk about systems and emotions, behavioral reasons. There's three really broad strokes, primary reasons why the ADHD tax continues to happen and they're really high level broad, so you know, we have to dig a lot deeper. But one of them is forgetfulness. Sometimes we truly do just flat out forget to renew our certification for something, right? I, I had a real estate broker's license. I totally forgot to get it renewed. So I paid an extra penalty for doing that. Sometimes we really do forget. And automation is obviously a good answer for that. David Allen talks about getting things done and really good stuff to look at. We got to get it out of our head. If I had just put that on my calendar, on my Google calendar, it would have reminded me three days or a week or whatever before time and it would have got done. So one of them is forgetfulness and we can cure that with automation and, and that. Another one is uh, ignoring, you know, your person that talked about getting arrested for, for driving without a license uh, and I did the same kind of thing. I ignored it. And, and the, the more often you ignore the nasty mail they sent you, the easier it is to ignore it. A lot of times my, my coaching clients, and I don't do too much coaching, but they come to me and one of them, high level professional lawyer, she's just perfect at what she does. She has bags of unopened mail and so much stress because of that. People sending her, you know, lawsuit type stuff and collections and things like that. It, it's like there's a piece missing somewhere from yeah. her because she's incredibly proficient at what she does. So we want to make sure we're not ignoring. And the tip on the mail, really, if you've got bags of mail that you haven't opened, open what comes in today and open what came in yesterday and then work your way back. Yeah. If someone was really wanted their money that sent you something six months ago, they've sent you 10 more letters since then. So open the most recent one and it probably has what you need. But we do have to kind of, you know, when you just need to open that mail and see what it says. And amazingly, and this is evolutionary, the rustling in the bushes scares us more than actually seeing the wolf that was making that noise. The unknown scares us more. So if you sure. open the mail from the IRS, you know it's bad news, but you open it, you will actually get a sense of relief because now you know what it is. And when you know what it is, you're more likely to take action. But when you're piling them up somewhere, it doesn't work. So ignoring is the second big thing. And then procrastinating. 
And the thing about procrastination, which the outside world thinks it's about laziness and irresponsibility, what it's really about is mood repair. There's something that's making you anxious. There's something else you could be doing that is less anxious producing. And so you say, you know what? I'll not do this anxiety producing thing right now. I'll do it later because of later. You don't attach the emotions to the later. You only attach to the actual, yeah, I can certainly write that blog. I don't need, it'd be easy to do it later. Of course, later when you sit down to do it, all the anxiety comes back again and it's actually worse because you're it is it is right. later. So realize that procrastination is mood repair, it has nothing to do with laziness. It's executive dysfunction. Like the, the idea of thinking about the things that you need to do but not taking action on it. That's not lazy. That's executive dysfunction. And the emotional right? part. It, it's it's it, all these things are underlied by by emotion. Um, we, we think in metaphors, at least I do. If you think of weather systems, you can have a high pressure area and a low pressure area. And what happens, the air flows from the high pressure to the low pressure. It just whoosh, it just goes, right? That It's trying to balance out. So when we're faced with something like writing a blog and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, someone's going to read it. I don't know if I can do it as well. People might not like it. And I don't know. All kinds of things that make me feel a little bit anxious, not desperately anxious, just annoyingly anxious, right? I don't like it. You notice and then it. there's something else like maybe I can go clean the garage and I have no anxiety about that. And it is productive. So I'll go do that. But I put off this other thing. It, the pseudo productivity, the pseudo uh, yeah, procrastination. I don't want to feel lazy. Yeah. I don't want to feel irresponsible by going to the beach because I just feel guilty sitting on the beach. But if I'm cleaning the garage, I've numbed myself out to this other thing, which was more important. That's largely what procrastination is about. It's mood repair. I wanted to share uh, one thing. That's more of a, a lesson learned uh, recently for me. I know you've talked about getting all of your, your bills sort of on, on auto pay. So when I was um, sort of setting up uh, my own finances uh, after my divorce, I wanted everything in one place. so I could see everything all together, which it makes a lot of sense, except for when you're all, you have something that's an auto pay that might like go up in price if you're not paying attention to your mail. Cause I almost lost my insurance coverage. I was about five days um, before I lost my coverage because I, my auto pay was still going, but it wasn't enough because my premium went up. So I saw that, oh, so there are certain types of accounts that actually make more sense to set it up through their website versus having everything centralized in your bank. Yeah. And actually, I would say 95%. Let them take the money out of you. You know, if they do something wrong, you talk to them and they'll fix it. But the you you want it that way. Because like you said, their, their price might change. Something might change. So I think it's really important to remediate the ADHD tax by building, as, as Russell Barkley would call, scaffolding. Mm -hmm. Build systems that keep you from getting off track. And that system can be reminders, timers, awareness, productivity skills, you know, taking your courses, find ways to get a scaffolding of support. And we are social creatures. Sometimes the social aspect of these things is the most powerful thing of all. Excellent. Uh, Rick Webster, the website is rena-fi.com. Check out what he's doing over there. He's got all kinds of uh, courses and he's got some groups going on. Uh, anything else, Rick, that you want to share as far as where people can reach you? First of all, they can take the dash out. They both work, but the dash is actually a little bit newer. We're, we're moving, we're just updating and we- uh, Dashing. So we took the dash out. Yeah, we're not dashing anymore. So there's that. We are actually, because of Attitude Magazine and um, and ADHD Online, a couple others, we are actually creating a course on the ADHD tax right now. And then we'll probably launch that in, in mid-August sometime. So pretty excited about that. That's what we do. We, we have courses and- people that come in and, and, and all that. We do podcasts very similar to this. And, great. and the fact is, this is exciting to me. Well, Rick, thank you for uh, making the, the message that you've made part of your message. We appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Great, Eric. Thank you very much. You bet. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And... Use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. 
If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.